All right, welcome back. It is 8.30, so we are pleased to have a certified uh, prosthetist orthotist presenting today. I'd like to introduce Michelle Hall. Michelle will be presenting on orthotic management considerations with complex pediatric patients. Michelle is an ABC certified prosthetist orthotist and a fellow with distinction of the American Academy of Orthotists and Prosthetists. She completed her bachelor's and master's degree in biomedical engineering at the University of Iowa and the University of Minnesota, respectively. She currently serves as Gillette's Prosthetics Team Lead and OMP Residency Director. So thank you, Michelle. You are muted. Hold on, Michelle. Thank you, Dr. Paulson. Can you confirm that you see my slides? Yes, we can see your slides. Perfect. Thanks so much. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for being here. As Dr. Paulson mentioned, I'm a process orthotist, and I'm going to be speaking about orthotic management considerations. Specifically, we're going to focus on a subset of lower limb orthoses, talk a bit about the differences between pediatric and adults and some of the similarities, and then really talk about the multidisciplinary uh, team approach. So we have a good mixture of people on the call that constitute our multidisciplinary team. And so I think it's really imperative with orthotic management that we are um, able to use that approach. Um, you know, the it's one of the situations that us working together as a team is better than the sum of the parts. So lower limb orthoses, um, oftentimes we're thinking about functional goals for these orthoses. So it may be extending or encouraging ambulation, um, controlling or preventing um, joint motion. Um, and oftentimes in peds, we're thinking about preventing the progression of deformities. We could also be thinking about axially unloading a limb, um, maintaining post-surgical um, positioning to ensure that they continue um, uh, healing in the optimal position, or it could just be protection. So, um, you know, our patient with myelomeningocele, for example, depending on the the level, um, they may be insensate in their lower limbs. So they may use um, lower limb orthoses not only to control joint motion, um, but also for protection. So there's also with orthotic management functional considerations. So we want to be thinking as clinicians, is this deformity fixed or flexible? What's the impact um, that the orthosis will have on adjacent joints, not just the ones that the orthosis crosses? Um, and from a clinical standpoint, if you're recommending orthoses, whether you are a pediatrician and primary care, a physiatrist or a therapist, um, it's really helpful to the orthotist to know what motions you're trying to control or eliminate. Like, what are your functional um, goals with the orthosis? Because that helps us really understand taking in your consideration as well as uh, the family's concerns, the patient's concerns and preferences. Then we can come to an optimal uh, recommendation for orthotic management. Um, so we also want to think about not only what motions need to be controlled or eliminated, but what can we allow? Do we in anticipate that this child is going to change over time, whether it be in range of motion or strength? And then do they use assistive devices or should we be considering the use of such devices? And then I can't emphasize enough, um, we really need to consider personal considerations. So um, there are potential side effects. So it could be a joint stiffness, skin irritation, more visits um, when they have uh, or orthoses and it could be also just the the whole like it takes longer to get dressed in the morning so it may be a imposition on the family um you know in adult cases on their work and on all persons cases whether you're a kid or adult um, on hobbies so we really need to consider that with um, a lot of the orthoses, not all, there are prefabricated options and there are custom molded ones. And so um, just to compare and contrast a little bit, prefabricated ones are going to be these typically to treat simple problems that don't need this preciseness of fit. Um, and they may be temporary and impairments, whereas custom molded, think about our child with um, cerebral palsy diplegia or uh, with spina bifida, where we have these long-term impairments um, 
potentially complex problems and we may need a really precise fit. With that said, my example, um, if it's a, a less complex issue, we may not need to go custom molded. Um, and the difference also, there's a significant difference in cost and, the, and durability. So even though prefabricated, it's less expensive, it tends to be less durable. So over a uh, same period of time, the child may go through more prefabricated devices and custom ones if that's the route we're using. Um, just in general, orthoses, this list here goes at the top from the least amount of control provided uh, to the bottom, the most pro uh, control provided. Um, we're just going to focus above the blue line here. So on anything distal to the knee, um, what are the orthoses that we tend to use? Um, just in the interest of time. So uh, foot orthoses can be prefabricated or custom molded. They provide um, medial longitudinal and possibly transverse arch support. Uh, they may have impacts at the knee and ankle um, positioning, uh, very rarely at the hip. Um, and so these are going to be those kids with mild or moderate pes planus or plantar valgus deformities, anything more support needed or um, if uh, you need sagittal um, talocural joint uh, control, then we're probably going to need to go with a different device because this won't help at the um, ankle as far as sagittal plane movement. UCBLs, um, named after the University of California Biomechanics Laboratory, um, they are very similar to foot orthoses, but they just grab a little bit more around the heel and thereby provide coronal plane um, control of the foot and ankle complex. So this is going to tend to be kids and adults who have calcaneal varus or valgus that you can't necessarily control with the foot orthosis, so you need to grab a little bit more. Um, however, um, in those patients that have severe spasticity, uh, talus vertical or a severe midfoot break, um, this is not the best option for them. Moving up the limb, supramalar orthoses provide increased ML ankle stability. They do not prevent sagittal plane motion. So generally speaking, you can plantar flex or dorsiflex uh, with that SMO. Um, a lot of, I think, therapists um, prefer them over AFOs if we can get away with it because there's less disuse atrophy uh, that may occur uh, with the use of the SMO. Again, we want to be thinking about what are the functional goals of the orthosis to while we're selecting um, which orthosis we choose. And so um, indications for SMOs tend to be those, think of like the hypotonic kids um, oftentimes with, um, you know, uh, maybe Down syndrome, who are just starting to pull to stand and they just need a little bit more ankle stability to do that and take first steps. That's often the kids that we might be starting with for SMOs. Um, and then any other kids that have milder deformities where the UCBL just isn't controlling that varus or valgus deformity at the ankle, um, we may give a little bit more stability in the coronal plane. However, anything more severe or again, if sagittal plane control is needed, um, then we're not going to be able to use an SMO and then we need to move up to probably an AFO, assuming that there's no not control needed at the knee. So ankle foot orthoses or AFOs provide significant foot and ankle stability, and there's a wide variety of what we can do with an AFO. So we have solid ankle, we have posterior leaf spring or PLS, articulated and ground reaction uh, designs. And so the articulated AFOs, um, there's a large variety um, in the design. So they can be free motion, they could assist motion, such as like a dorsiflexion assist that might help with foot clearance during swing phase, or they might have adjustable motion where um, we can adjust the range of plantar dorsiflexion motion that's allowed through the gait cycle. Um, in the case of the first two, we can also have an external posterior plantar flexion stop um, that in addition to whatever features that joint has, um, it can additionally prevent plantar flexion. So we do see sort of free motion with a plantar flexion stop used quite a bit in our practice at Gillette. Um, these may be heavier and bulkier uh, than other designs. And a real key here is that the patient needs to have ankle joint um, motion um, as well as knee stability. And so when we're thinking about um, putting someone in a hinged AFO, we want to really make sure with the knee extended, they have good uh, dorsiflexion uh, and potentially plantar flexion range of motion.
So posterior leaf springs, you can see here um, in the picture down below, the plastic is cut um, posterior to the malleoli, um, and it tends to be a thin spring, hence where the name comes in the posterior aspect. Um, so this really um, provides a sagittal plane control, so it allows planar flexion um, during um, it, initial contact through lidding response for a more normal first rocker. And then it, it controls the progression of the tibia over the foot um, through second rocker mid stance and then provides foot clearance during swing phase. Some of the prefabricated options uh, that are carbon fiber or even there's custom versions that come in carbon fiber may additionally in late stance provide a push off um, just because of the loading of the spring. The thermoplastic designs don't tend to, to have that ability, or at least not as noticeably. Uh, there, like I said, there's custom and prefabricated options. So these are going to tend to be used for um, persons with foot drop. Um, and sometimes, you know, in our CP population, um, we'll see uh, Aquinas due to mild spasticity. Um, and this um, may uh, be a good option, um, whether it's the off the shelf uh, hybrid or a custom uh, design. And so if they have severe spasticity, they'll override this design, or if they have strong coronal plane deformities, they may also um, override it. Uh, the trim lines around the foot, because uh, they come up and grab the heel, uh, with this, with a thermoplastic design, oftentimes we can still control mild uh, varus or valgus at the ankle. One thing that we're able to do quite a bit more now than we were able to do, say, 10 to 20 years ago, is provide kids with hybrid designs where we use a prefabricated carbon fiber AFO with either a custom foot orthosis or UCBL if they need additional foot, you know, medial longitudinal arch support. Um, and the nice thing with this is that they may use the AFO for more active parts of their day. Um, and in quieter parts, they might just be using uh, the custom foot orthosis or UCBL. So it gives a lot more um, variety in how they use the device to the, the patient families. So it's been a nice option to have. Um, solid ankle AFOs, These this is like think maximal stability at the ankle without pressing the knee. Um, so this is going to provide uh, contr control in both the coronal, um, sagittal, and um, to a certain extent, uh, transverse planes. And you can see the trim lines are anterior to the malleoli. These are in patients that have weak planning or Planner or dorsiflexor um, muscle strength. They may have flaccidity distal to the knee. Um, and even we can control um, moderate um, sagittal instabilities or deformities at the knee. Um, there's a lot we can do with um, any of the custom designs to really address things. Um, but if you need more control at the knee, you're going to need to go cross the knee for a KFO. So ground reaction AFOs are kind of the exception to what I just said of needing to uh, go to KFO. So in some cases, we are able, if you think of like the patients with three plus quad strength um, or a crouch gait, um, the ground reaction AFO actually creates a knee extension moment through mid and late stance. Um, they tend to be very rigid at the ankle and the forefoot in order to do that. Um, and uh, this is a nice option if we're trying to avoid crossing the knee, just because as soon as we go to a KFO, um, it's more bulk, it's more, um, you know, weight that they're having to carry. Um, it's a greater imposition on the patient and family. So we really try to stay um, at the AFO level if we're able to. So really thinking that what's the minimum that can control um, whatever we're trying to achieve. So moving on to uh, pediatric and adult concepts. Um, so when we're thinking about replacing orthoses, it's really based on medical necessity, no matter the age. So this could be due to changes in function, growth, weight loss or gain uh, that's significant, orthosis breakage or loss, um, or changes in vocational needs. So oftentimes the orthotist is going to try to make multiple adjustments um, to uh, accommodate those changes with the exception of like breakage or loss, we probably can't do too much. Um, 
But in the other cases, we may be adjusting the uh, orthoses to see if that works for the patient. And if it doesn't, then we know why we need to change uh, design or go to a new one. So uh, just to give you perspective, toddlers are usually um, having their orthoses changed every six to nine months because they're growing so rapidly. Children, it's typically an annual basis, um, which is why our teens and adults um, that have used uh, orthoses throughout their lifetime think that they just get a new AFO every year. Year, that's not the case. Um, teens typically every uh, nine months to two years, and then adults can actually use the same orthosis. Up, I've seen twenty years um, in in practice with just getting the um, orthoses refurbished every year. It really depends on what um, they're using. That would be more in the case of the AFOs or KFOs. Um, this, I thought, was a really interesting pilot study published in 2011 by ACPOC um, for the reasons of discontinuing orthotic management. More than half of them, uh, the physician no longer prescribed the orthosis. Um, a quarter, the family just decided to self-discharge. 15%, the patient chose to discharge um, and or throw it in the closet. And then 8%, um, the orthosis, the patient felt never fit right. And so they just decided not to follow up. They definitely did, um, you know, discard it. And so this, um, you know, bears the, the um, issue of increasingly with age, we need to do more negotiation, us as a clinic team with the patients and families. So really understanding the orthotic history and the patient's perceived needs when they are a teenager or uh, adult is really imperative. And then we've really found, um, you know, over the past uh, 16 years that I've been at Gillette, we've really on the adult side of things, taken a minimalist approach of taking a step back and said, is this still what you need now um, and looking at kind of are there hybrid or prefabricated options? Can we use this as a tool for certain activities? Um, but with that, we need to understand the limits of the orthoses um, and also considering use of uh, possible assistive devices is really um, allows us to adjust what the um, what we prescribe orthotically and ultimately fit. And then also we work quite closely with our physical therapist to understand, is this something on the therapy side we can address or is this something um, orthotically we need to address? So the team approach is really imperative um, with our patient populations that we see at Gillette and that you all um, see with us. And um, so again, with kids just aren't big adults. So I love this picture on the right because it really, I think uh, when they say a, a picture th says a thousand words, I think that says it for me. Um, so with kids, there's oftentimes they have a lot more flexibility in their joints. And so we can use aggressive modifications to correct to more of a neutral position, whereas adults have more rigidity and we tend to have to accommodate more than correct. Um, and I think one thing we do nicely in our um, clinic uh, on the for, with our teens and adults is take a step back annually and say, is this still what you need? Does this make sense um, for where your goals, um, vocation, uh, function, any hobbies, et cetera? Um, I think all of us can uh, really help our patients and families with preparing for transition from childhood into adulthood. Um, and one of the biggest things is helping to encourage them to become advocates for themselves at a young age. Um, so simple things in childhood we could do is encourage them to don and doff their orthosis independently and be responsible for that. Obviously, cognition uh, plays a role. Um, we see a, a large span of cognitions and maturity, so that um, we need to consider. Um, but then starting to have the, the family prepare the patient to advocate for themselves in childhood and I'd say even adolescence. Um, and depending on the child, I'm starting to transition them in at adolescence and for sure in teenage years to independently meeting with the orthotist. I see our colleagues in therapies doing this all the time um, where you're meeting the family in the lobby, you're bringing the child back, working with them. And then um, in, in the case of teens or adolescents, having the kid um, report back to the parents and then us filling in the blanks of wherever they miss, just to start to build those skills. Um, and the teenagers, we need to start talking about what are their where are they thinking for careers and after school? Um, 
you know, we can often connect them with an orthotist if they move for college or a job, depending on, you know, where they are in that paradigm of their abilities. Um, and then we really need to start uh, discussing potential changes in insurance coverage for when they, I think the magic number right now is about age 25 when um, children are often getting kicked up off of uh, their parents' insurance um, unless they have a job sooner and such. So the other thing we need to uh, do with teens and adults is um, give more time. They can provide more feedback. They have a longer attention span. And um, maintaining independence um, is really important to these age groups. Um, and they just have greater experience with orthosis use. And so we just need to acknowledge that and learn from them what, what are their patient preferences and how can we negotiate with them. Um, they also may just take longer walking down the hall, donning and doffing, um, et cetera. So we just have to spend, we need to, a lot more time for these appointments. Um, we also want to consider vocational needs. And these may change with their vocation. So um, compared to their home life, so, for example, a physician I work with uh, needs a carbon fiber PLS AFO with a pretibial shell uh, for standing all day in clinic, but he uses a FES device for hiking. Um, and so we also, there's a nurse I work with that I fitted her with a dorsiflexion assist AFO and a custom foot orthosis. She uses both to avoid tripping due to fatigue in the workplace. Um, but then at home, she just uses the foot orthosis unless she's going out for long walks or something where she would need the extra dorsi assist. And so we really kind of focus um, with our teens and adults about thinking about orthotic management as a tool in your toolbox. And so there's multiple different ways that you can use that. Um, and and um, I just had a conversation with a patient this week that they're not committing to using it all day, every day, like they did in childhood. Um, but what can we do um, to help um, give them those tools that they need? Um, moving on to the multidisciplinary team approach. Oh, how'd that get in there? It's literally patient-centered care, but I don't think that's what we usually think of as pa patient-centered care. I think this looks better. So with the patient, the family, um, and then uh, the rest of the team all working together um, with the best available evidence and clinical techniques um, in considering patient preferences. So um, with a team approach to care, we really want to look holistically at the patient's needs and what we what care can we provide to them. Um, so the pediatrician or family practice physicians are generally the ones giving um, us that holistic perspective on the medical needs, and they're typically the first point of contact with our patients. Um, when physiatry is then pulled in, they're going to provide us the perspective on surgical and therapeutic interventions, um, and we um, in our orthotics department at Gillette work quite closely with our uh, PM&R department. Um, as an orthotist, we're going to consider the biomechanical needs of the patient to achieve their mobility um, and other functional goals, and then also do a lot of troubleshooting of the design based on feedback from the team. So um, we work really closely with the physical and occupational therapist to who often are, once the pediatrician sees them, sometimes the, the therapist gets looped in next um, before maybe physiatry or, or an orthotist. And so um, they may be the ones uh, identifying the potential need for the orthosis um, through their episode of care. Um, but the therapists, we really rely on um, them to provide uh, strategies for the use of the orthosis. They will work with the patient and family to practice donning and doffing, you know, for the older uh, kids and adults, you know, maintaining that um, independence. And then also working on the different mobility considerations. So, for example, some of our patients may use a reverse walker um, at home and indoors or short distances in the community, but they may use a wheelchair for longer distance mobility. And so our therapists are the ones really assisting uh, with that decision making. Um, so I've been talking about how great this team approach is. And at Gillette, we can, um, you know, oftentimes we're just down the hall from each other. So it happens naturally. But with you all, we're at different facilities. So how can we still make that happen? Um, maybe we have 
of a family in um, northern Minnesota and the pediatrician is nearby, the therapist maybe is a half hour drive. Um, the physiatrist perhaps is at Gillette or at one of our outlying uh, clinics and the orthotist similarly um, isn't right there. Um, you know, for better or worse, one of the things that happened in 2020 was telemedicine really um, became more widely used. And um, I have to say with some of my patients that live up north, I um, use telemedicine to address some things to make sure that I have everything that's needed um, and prepared before I see them. And we're able to similarly you um, use telemedicine to work together, to see a patient together. We also sometimes use videos and then, um, you know, debrief afterwards uh, together so that we all understand what's needed and are able to make the changes that are needed. Um, so that was a really quick overview of lower limb orthoses, um, pediatric versus adult concepts. And I can't emphasize enough how glad I am that you all are here today um, and how much I look forward to continuing to move this multidisciplinary team approach uh, forward together as a group. So I think I, I think we have maybe five minutes, um, unless we're taking another five minute break, Dr. Paulson, um, you can advise me. Yeah, we can take a few minutes for questions. I see one in the chat right now. Are you seeing that one? Yep. Uh huh. Yeah. So, um, that's with on a student with low muscle tone using inner foot to push them or to push, and then with AFOs having more difficulty and refusing to do more crawling. Students non ambulatory, they don't send the AFOs to the school. Um, Oh, for pushing to stand. Yeah, you know, I would be curious in that particular case, Sherry, um, to potentially get them connected initially with physical therapy and then pull in the orthotist um, with that. So, um, like I said at Gillette, I understand we are, um, you know, really lucky that we're down the hall from each other, the orthotics department and rehab therapies department. So, we often co-treat together. Um, but I think with taking some um, video um, and maybe even pulling both a therapist and an orthotist in together um, or having the therapist and the orthotist work together might be a good option. It's really hard. I have like probably more questions for that particular case than answers for how you might approach that. Um, but, you know, Sometimes we do find switching maybe to SMOs or something, um, meeting the family where they are at, where we can start to get more stability that we need for pulling to stand. Um, so the next question is about Sure Step brand products. Um, oh, in two, two part. Um, so AFOs with a SMO height inner boot, I think is, is what you're getting at. Um, so we do use SureStep. Um, it has a place. There's a limited group, I, I think, where um, we would use um, SureStep. Similarly, we do sometimes use uh, Cascade Defo uh, for, say, SMOs, just because maybe the way that they fabricate is a little different than um, they have some proprietary materials that we don't have access to um, in the clinic setting um, where maybe we get better medial lateral dorsal flaps at the midfoot to give better control. Um, we do um, both um, internally fabricate as well as um, get central fabricated versions of the AFOs with the uh, SMO inner boot. So those might be cases where with a regular thermoplastic AFO, you can't quite get the control on the midfoot. Maybe they're continuing to um, pronate, for lack of a better term, right off the top of my head, uh, within the orthosis. Um, and so the SMO inner boot may actually help control um, 
some of the coronal plane and transverse plane motions uh, within the AFO. So sometimes those are a nice option. Um, and sure step, it just depends if the patient is a, a presents pretty straightforward, we may use that um, as an option otherwise. Um, and I would say for probably smaller kids and then we move up and do more of our own custom ones. Um, and then, yeah, so I certainly appreciate that um, children with disabilities are having a hard time getting to doctors. And I think that's where um, I'm seeing both on the orthotic side as well as um, in our prosthetics clinic that we are using a little bit more of telemedicine. Um, you can actually see quite a bit in a video when a patient's in their home setting. Um, and, and sometimes that's helpful, but I think our uh, physiatry team has shared with me that some there's certain times where you really need to have your hands on your patients to be able to feel them and and make a better judgment of what what they're doing. So I think judging by Dr. Paulson popping on that I am done, but I'm happy to take more questions at the Q and A section around lunchtime today. So thanks everyone. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Michelle. Yep. So reminder, keep putting questions in the chat and we'll be able to do more at the Q&A at about 1115. Um, and so appreciate it. And then the other comment about being able to have patients reach physicians. So Gillette does have outreach clinics to help with that, as well as we work collaboratively with a lot of other um, specialists around the state. And you can always go through physical medicine rehab to work on orthotics or with